everyone! This video is about endocytosis and exocytosis, which are two types of membrane transport processes. We've been talking in class about some other membrane transport processes already, so we'll start this video with a quick review of some of the processes that we've already seen. We started with passive membrane transport processes, which are movement down a concentration gradient from where something is in high concentration to where it's at low concentration. And the first method of passive membrane transport that we looked at was simple diffusion, which is when molecules can simply wiggle their way between phospholipids to get across a membrane. So in this example here, we've got our cell membrane here represented by this double layer of phospholipids. And you can see we're starting with a concentration gradient. This blue molecule is very highly concentrated on this side of the membrane, and it's much less or none on this side of the membrane. And as time goes by, this molecule is able to just diffuse between the phospholipids until it's approximately equally concentrated on both sides of the membrane. And this only works for small nonpolar molecules that can interact easily with the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids in the membrane. Another process that we looked at is facilitated diffusion, which is similar, but when molecules move across the membrane by going through a transport protein. In this example down here, you can see once again, there is a concentration gradient with a high concentration on this side of the membrane and a low concentration of the green molecule on this side of the membrane. And the molecules are moving down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low, but rather than going through the phospholipids, they have to go through a transport protein. And this occurs when we have molecules that are still small, but charged or polar, and so they can't interact easily with the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids. And the classic example of this is osmosis, or the movement of water across a membrane. These processes will proceed until the system reaches equilibrium, or the molecules are approximately equally distributed on both sides of the membrane, and they do not require any additional energy. They're completely based on the kinetic energy and natural motion of the molecules. We also have learned about active transport, which is movement up or against a concentration gradient, movement from where a molecule is less concentrated to where it is more concentrated. In this example, the membrane is represented by the gray line, and you can see that there's still a concentration gradient. There's more of the blue molecule on this side than this side, but rather than going down the concentration gradient from high concentration to low, these molecules are actually being moved up or against their concentration gradient from low concentration to high. And you can see that it is going through a transport protein again, and it also requires energy in the form of ATP to move molecules against their concentration gradient. But all of these processes we've looked at so far involve moving relatively small objects across the cell membrane, ones that can either wiggle between the phospholipids or move through a protein that's embedded in the membrane that's also relatively small. But what if a cell needs to move something really big across the membrane, like this extremely realistic example here? You can tell just from looking that whatever this object is, it's too large to wiggle between the phospholipids and it's too large to move through the transport protein. So cells need other mechanisms to move large objects into and out of the cell across the membrane. And that's what this video is gonna focus on. When cells need to move large objects into or out of the cell, they will use vesicles. And we've seen vesicles already this year when we were learning about um, how proteins are produced and, and transported out of the cell. So we've learned about vesicles that can pinch off the rough endoplasmic reticulum and move to the Golgi and fuse with the Golgi. And we learned about vesicles that can leave the Golgi, pinch off from there and fuse with the cell membrane outside. So this is something we've seen before. And you already know that vesicles can fuse with or pinch off of other membranes in the cell and that's because vesicles and cell membranes are made of the same thing. They're both primarily made of that double layer of phospholipids, that phospholipid bilayer. So if we were to zoom in on a cell membrane, you'd see it's mostly made of this double layer of phospholipids and the vesicle, same thing. It's a smaller piece, smaller sphere, but once again, this double layer of phospholipids. And you know from studying membranes that there'd be other things embedded in there too, like proteins and maybe cholesterol, but they're mostly made up of this double layer of phospholipids. So there are two vesicle-based membrane transport processes that cells can use. There's endocytosis, which moves large objects into cells, and exocytosis, which moves large objects out of cells. So we're gonna take a closer look at each one of these and how they work. We'll start with endocytosis. So this moves objects into cells, 
And the, the prefix endo just literally means inside, so moving things inside the cell. So this might enable a cell to take in food particles from the outside, engulf prey items, and things like that. How does it work? Well, the first thing that has to happen is the cell needs to know that there's something outside that it wants. It needs some way of sensing an object. In this diagram here, we've got the cell membrane as this curved red line separating the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm here, from the extracellular fluid here. And here's an object that this cell wants. We're not going to go into details about how the cell senses these objects. It's using surface proteins and some chemical signaling. You don't need to know about that for this class, but you just need to know that there's something there that the cell wants to get inside, but it's too large to move between the phospholipids or through a transport protein. So instead, the cell membrane is going to pocket inwards to create a layer of membrane around that object or create a vesicle around that object. And as it keeps moving inwards, it will keep pocketing further and further inwards until that vesicle can completely pinch off from the cell membrane and move into the cell. So that's what we see in step three over here. And then that vesicle and the object inside it can travel to wherever they're going in the cell by moving along microtubule tracks being pulled by a motor protein. So here's another image depicting the process of endocytosis. Our cell membrane is this yellow line here, and it's separating the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm, from the extracellular fluid here. And this blue diamond is an object that the cell wants. So the cell will pocket the membrane inwards to create a vesicle around it, and then that vesicle will move into the cell to go where it needs to go. Now, in performing this process, membrane actually gets removed from the cell surface, from the cell membrane, to make that vesicle. And so it reduces the total surface area of the cell membrane around the cell. We'll come back to that idea later. You should also know that there are some different variations on this endocytosis process. We've been looking at a process by which the membrane pockets inwards, but sometimes cells can do something a little more active and actually reach out and extend pseudopods to engulf particles. In this example here, we've got an amoeba, so similar to the cells you saw in class, and this little purple thing is a food object that it wants. So rather than just hoping and waiting for this purple object to move towards it, it will actually reach out and grab it. And in doing so, it's creating a layer of membrane around that purple thing, and so it is in effect putting it in a vesicle to move it into the cell. So it's another form of endocytosis. The other process you need to know about is exocytosis, where cells move large objects out of the cell. And the prefix exo just means outside. So this is a process by which cells can secrete proteins, release waste, and get rid of anything else they need to get out of the cell. How does this one work? Well, to tell you the truth, it's pretty much the opposite of the other process, but we'll go through the steps. To start the process, there's got to be some vesicle containing an object that needs to leave the cell. And that vesicle that's inside the cell moves towards the cell membrane. So it's moving towards the outside of the cell. And once again, it's traveling along those microtubule tracks being pulled by a motor protein. When the vesicle gets to the membrane, it fuses with the cell membrane because they're once again made of those same phospholipid bilayers. And then in doing that, it releases whatever the object was inside. So the object gets released to the outside of the cell and then it can go wherever it needs to go out into the extracellular fluid. And as this happens, the membrane that was making up the vesicle becomes part of that outside cell membrane. It joins together and becomes part of what's on the outside of the cell. Here's another diagram depicting that process. We've got a vesicle here with some object that needs to leave the cell. It moves towards the cell membrane. The vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, and then the object is released to the outside and the membrane that used to be part of the vesicle is now part of that larger cell membrane or plasma membrane. So this process adds membrane to the cell surface, to that cell membrane. And in doing so, it increases the surface area of the plasma membrane. There are a few other things you need to know about these two processes. One of them is that both endocytosis and exocytosis are not driven by concentration gradients. It doesn't matter whether they have a high concentration or a low concentration inside or outside of the cell. They're based on what the cell needs to take in and get rid of. Also, both of these processes require energy in the form of ATP. There's some very energy expensive things going on, such as changing the shape of the cell membrane. In this diagram here of endocytosis, you can see the cell extending out the plasma membrane to engulf this particle and produce a vesicle around it. 
changing this, the shape of the plasma membrane out here requires a reorganization of the cytoskeletal fibers that are right under here supporting that cell membrane. So that takes energy. And also once the vesicle is in the cell, it requires energy to move it along those microtubule tracks. Here you can see a vesicle getting pulled along a microtubule track by a motor protein. And this motor protein needs lots and lots of ATP to walk down the microtubule to pull that vesicle. And finally, these processes of endocytosis and exocytosis must occur at approximately equal rates in a cell in order for the cell not to get bigger or smaller because it could be gaining or losing membrane. So we don't want the cell to gain or lose too much membrane. If the cell is doing much more endocytosis, then it's going to be losing membrane. And if the cell is doing much more exocytosis, it's going to be adding a lot of vesicle pieces to its larger cell membrane. So in order for the cell to to stay happy and healthy, those two processes need to kind of balance out. And in this diagram here, you can see both endocytosis and exocytosis happening in this cell as it takes in food particles in a vesicle, uses a lysosome to digest them, and then releases waste via exocytosis. I should mention also that your cells don't do these processes in quite the same way. Because you're a big fancy human with a whole digestive system, your individual cells don't need to take in food this way via endocytosis. And they, they don't release their, the, the waste that you digest in quite the same way. But this is how a protist or a similar creature might take in and process their food and get rid of their waste. So to review, small objects can enter or exit cells via the processes of simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. And in all three of these, they could be moving either between the phospholipids or through a transport protein. So it only works if they're small. But large objects cannot pass through phospholipids or through transport proteins, so they require vesicles to get into or out of the cells. The process of endocytosis moves large objects into cells, and the process of exocytosis moves large objects out of cells. So now you've learned all the different types of membrane transport processes that you need to know for this class. So until next time, take care of yourself, take care of each other.